What's up, everybody? It's the morning of surgery. Walking to the hospital. Should be there in about a few minutes. Really, I'm really fucking nervous. To be honest, I'm pretty terrified. I don't know when the next time I'll be able to walk like so easily a mile and a half to the hospital is. I'm hopeful, optimistic, and terrified. That's how I feel. I've been smiling, I've been crying, I've been up and down. Uh, I've been thinking about turning back. I've been <laughs> uh, not considering turning back at all at the same time. Uh, it's kind of a flood of emotions and, and a big mix, but realistically, I've always known this is something I have to do. And we will see how it looks on the other side, but living like this was not possible. So to me, there's not really much of a choice, just hope. What's up, everybody? It's Mike checking in after surgery, camera up. Today is my 15th day post-op and I'm doing fantastic and very excited to share with all you guys my progress and my updates. But where I want to start is, uh, where you should start is managing your expectation for the hospital, for your inpatient stay, for your first two weeks. So I want to go over what my expectation was of what my hospital stay would look like in my first two weeks after surgery, and then I'll go into what I'm actually experiencing, how that's transferring into reality, and some of the problems and hiccups that I've had that kind of were unexpected. My expectation was to spend, I was told four or five nights in the hospital for my doctor. I internalized that as four would be a great sign, but let's expect five nights. Uh, I think in my previous video, I said I'm expecting to be in the hospital for five nights. My expectation was five nights in the hospital. I was told that surgery was on a Tuesday and that I, it was starting at 8 a.m. or by 9 a.m. I would actually be out and we would be starting. Uh, I was going to the operating room about 8 a.m. It was intended to be about a six hour operation that would put the end time at 3 p.m. I was told I would wake up in the intensive recovery unit at around four o'clock-ish, uh, and I'd probably be kept there through the night until the next morning, until at least 8 a.m. on Wednesday, when I would be transferred from, my, from the intensive recovery to a normal inpatient stay room. The first morning, first day post-op is Wednesday, so I was told day one post-op Wednesday I would be moved to my room. I would told the expectation is to be able to sit up straight on day one. I was told the expectation is to stand up on day two uh, and hopefully not get too dizzy or lightheaded and feel balanced. Uh, walk if you can, but I was told the expectation by day three is that I am walking uh, very slow and gingerly. Uh, I was expecting to leave the hospital on Saturday. The discharge check marks included being able to walk, uh, and walking is can be with the assistance of a walker or a cane or any uh, form, but you must be able to walk and balance yourself with some form of assistance, but besides another human or aid. Being able to do the flight of three steps up and down with the handrail, to be able to urinate, and to be able to pass gas. I was also told I'd wake up with a catheter in, and that catheter would come out Wednesday morning. So. That was my expectation for my hospital stay. The expectation for when I left the hospital and transitioned home on that fifth day, expected to be Saturday, was that I would be really sore, uh, be walking really slowly. I would be likely to spend three to five minutes standing at a time and was encouraged to do so every one to two hours. Uh, as much movement as possible, but uh, not pushing into the point of pain. Often people say, no pain, no gain. Right after surgery, the, the sentence is, no pain, no pain. My expectation was for the first about two weeks to be doing that three to five minutes standing at a time. And I was hoping by this point around day 15, I was able to start doing you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes standing at a time. This is the reality. Here's how it kind of went and then I'm gonna talk about why it might have went that way and go from there. Not bad. Mm -hmm. If you just saw that video, you would see that I am walking on night zero. So I was able to be discharged. Let's, let's take this from the top. 
uh, I, I woke up in the recovery room around 2.30 or 3 o'clock and I saw my doctor and he said everything went great. Uh, we did exactly the levels that we, we decided. Every single screw was able to fit in. Um, and he told me that all went well and here I was in the recovery room. I do remember when I woke up, the first thing I said was, oh God, I'm gonna throw up. And a, and a nurse brought me a tray and I just started throwing up from the anesthesia. Uh, it was mainly like dry heaving and a lot of saliva because I hadn't eaten that day. Um, but one of the most painful experiences uh, and startling experiences is having your full chest be surgically metallicized and then having that forceful flexion motion of throwing up through that uh, was not fun at all. Uh, but within about two hours in that recovery room, I started looking at the docs and being like, I'm good, I'm ready to go. When can I go up to my room? By five o'clock on day zero, five o'clock p.m., so I woke up around 2.30. By 5.30, I was in what, what they call the step-down unit, which is like the first stage of a normal recovery room. I had a roommate, I had nurses, I did, was not in a room full of like 20 hospital beds of people who just got out of surgery and intensive recovery. I was like, actually had some space and some, I was able to get my belongings. I was able to get my phone and call some people. Uh, that was not of expectation at all. I was told I would get all of my stuff brought to me Wednesday when I first got to a room. But here I am Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. able to have my phone. And that first night experienced zero pain. There was, uh, I was taking the, the drugs on the time and the schedule that they gave me. We were staying ahead of it. I did not wake up in excruciating pain. I did not have a moment of excruciating pain really the entire time in the hospital for four days. Uh, that definitely surpassed my expectations. The pain was incredibly well managed in the hospital. I was not really in that much pain. I do want to share a quick story about my roommate uh, night one, very funny. I, I remember being in the room and just having this eight level thoracic fusion and my roommate uh, in the corner with the nice view out NHSS overlooks the water so he got the view with the water and I'm like looking at the wall all night all night long every hour to this guy is just screaming oh just fucking kill me oh my god this fucking sucks and here I am like hey dude you okay over there and he asked me he goes, what did you have done he said I had eight level fusion today he goes, eight levels? I just had four done and I feel like I'm gonna die. What did I learn from that experience? Managing expectations is very important. I was well aware that I would wake up feeling not great and I expected to feel probably how he felt. However, I know for a fact, if I had woke up how he felt, I would not be saying, come fucking kill me. I would say, this is normal. This is part of the expectation. I'm gonna breathe, I'm gonna try and sleep, I'm gonna get my body ready to heal. He was very caught off guard and I highly suggest you work in your powers not to be caught off guard like that. It did not seem like the most pleasant way to wake up from this surgery. Uh, the night continues and I actually stayed awake from 1 a.m. till 9 a.m. 1 a.m. Wednesday morning until 9 a.m. when they moved me to my regular room. Uh, the nurse came and checked on me every like two or three hours and there I was like working on my laptop or like on my phone and she's like, you're still awake? And I looked at her and I was like, her name was Cassie and if she ever sees this, she was unbelievable. I told her about the channel. So if you do see this, hi Cassie, you were a phenomenal nurse. I was like, I felt so fine that first night. Like I was like the most productive I've been in about a year in terms of like getting work done. I was like doing a lot of heal with Mike stuff and working on my YouTube channel and like customizing things and like developing my email inbox and working on my email signature. My mind was, was sharp because my body felt no pain for the first time in a long time. In terms of the catheter, uh, this is a big one for males, a big concern, certainly was a big concern of mine. No reason for it to be that big of a concern. I woke up with a catheter in. I had no idea that a catheter in was in. Some people say that they could feel little pressure. Uh, I asked someone like, hey, do I have a catheter in right now? And they're like, yeah, you do. Um, and I, I learned how a catheter works before the surgery. The way a catheter works is that it's constantly dripping from your bladder. It's constantly causing, your, your kidneys is constantly dripping, feeding into your bladder, and, and the catheter is constantly draining that. So when you have a catheter in, 
you really should feel no urge to urinate. Like, there should be no like, oh my God, my bladder is building up and I need to release this because the bladder is constantly being released. Uh, if you do feel an urge, you might it might just be like a muscle spasm as a, as a reaction to the catheter, but there should be no like sensation there. However, I did have a, a little bit of a sensation there. And then to say, the sensation was like, I have to pee. So I said to Cassie, my nurse, I said, Cassie, it feels like I have to pee. Like, I know you said I have a catheter in and I learned how these works, but like, I know that I have to pee right now. It feels exactly like I have to pee. So in my mind, I thought my muscles must be spasming around the catheter and having that normal reaction. She checked the line for me. And it turns out that the line of my catheter uh, was like a little like kinked, like, you know, when you have a hose and you like kink it and just shut the water stops. So because there was a little bit of a kink in the catheter, the catheter wasn't constantly dripping. So my bladder did have time to fill up. So I did feel the urge to pee like just any normal human. And as soon as she unkinked it, it just immediately went. And I was like, oh my God, I feel like I'm peeing. So she asked me, do you want to remove the catheter now? Uh, normally we wait until the doctor gives the clearance the next morning, but like it's clear that I could do it for you right now if you want. Uh, I asked her, what's the worst thing that happens? She says, if you can't pee in the next six hours, we have to put this back in you and you're gonna be awake during it. So I said, like, Cassie, like, I don't feel it at all. It's not bothering me one bit, so let's just leave it in. I don't wanna cross that bridge. Anyways, Wednesday morning, I wake up and uh, I see my, my doc comes in to see me, tells me everything went great again. We go over pretty much the same conversation. He probably thinks I don't remember having the conversation with him on Tuesday, but I do. And he checked the incision. He we he had the nurse remove the catheter. He checked on the drain the the drain that he has because they have they leave a drain in in case there's any leakage. All signs were pointing great, and it was clearance for okay, Mike. This afternoon, when they give you when when your room is ready, we're gonna move you up there so you have a permanent stay. Uh, I had a, a little bit of a smile knowing that I was leaving Mr. Go fucking kill me, and gonna maybe have my own room or just a different roommate. I get transferred up. Uh, my mom comes to visit her hours at two o'clock on Wednesday. That was the first time she was able to see me because of the COVID rules. She is with me when we're moving from that one room to the next room and we go meet uh, this other roommate, a nice older gentleman. Uh, he was there for not even a full evening and I'm gonna <laughs> tell the story about my second roommate in a little bit. I know that I passed all my discharge discharge check marks or was able to literally leave the hospital if I wanted to within 24 hours of surgery. I decided to stay for three days because, and I left after three nights instead of four or five nights, uh, because I figured that the nurse care was just better than being at home. And I figured doctors to come check on the incisions and take care of, handle all the pain meds and bring me my food and whatever. I just figured, you know what, for the next two nights, it's probably better I still stay here. My expectation at that point was I'm gonna stay, still stay the full five nights. Uh, I didn't know that I was gonna be planning to leave early. By day two, I was, I was moving, I was walking, I was able to get, log roll myself up, stand up on my own and walk. I didn't feel like I needed a walker or anyone with me. Um, however, hospital rules stipulate that you can't walk without a nurse with you and they preferred me to use a walker because I was so Im immediately after surgery. By day three, I knew that this was like slowing me down by being there. I knew that uh, I wanted to walk. They told me three to five minutes every hour. I wanted to do that. I wanted to be up every hour. Um, I felt ready for it. I felt comfortable to do it. I wanted to start working on myself. I wanted to start moving and getting things working again. So by day three, I had my mom like hounding the nurses of like, when can we leave? When can we leave? Let's get the discharge paperwork going. And I left on day three and returned home. The biggest problem that I had in the hospital was constipation. Uh, by day three, the constipation felt so bad in, in my stomach and like felt like such abdominal pains that like every time I would take one of the painkillers, I knew I was doing more harm than good. So by day three, I stopped taking painkillers when I left the hospital completely. I didn't take a painkiller until day six again. So, so day three, four, and five, I only used Tylenol. I definitely felt uh, increased soreness as to be expected to be sore and pain when I got home a few days after surgery. 
Uh, it was manageable and it was handleable because it was all part of the process. The stomach pain was so bad that it was even worse than the back pain. And like I was so fixated on what my stomach was going through that I, that's what I wanted to treat. So I was only taking Tylenol because that wouldn't uh, further bind to my stomach. What really did the trick to me and what worked to get my bowels going, and I did not have a bowel movement until day seven, uh, was drinking a magnesium citrate uh, drink. This is pretty much what they give people for a colonoscopy cleanse. Yeah, it worked. I drank that stuff and like seven hours later, uh, I broke this, I call it, I broke the seal. Since I was able to have a bowel movement, that was a huge win for me because I was able to start taking pain meds again to then help facilitate my movement to be able to move more so once i was doing more i would get more sore and take pain meds and then also to help me sleep throughout the night sleeping has been very difficult i'm constantly moving positions i'm going to show you guys the different positions that i've been able to sleep in when i first got out of surgery the main thing the main place that i was sleeping was on the recliner so i mentioned that power lift recliner the power feature here's the remote control I was able to recline myself back, pretty self-explanatory. When it comes to the bed, I was able to, within the first few nights, transition to the bed and I'll show you exactly how I slept and what I would do. I would use this pillow for no other reason than when I'm lying on my side and putting it next to my head, it's like the right height. So I would put this pillow on the corner of the bed, doesn't matter what corner, and I would sit the opposite side, take your shoes off, and then you'll be able to, you'll, you'll be taught the log roll in the hospital if you don't know it already. You will work with a PT who will show you how to do the log roll. I would do the log roll down, which means coming down onto my shoulder, kicking my feet up, and rolling onto my back, and being in this position. I was not able to do this right after surgery, but I was able to get onto my side like this. I would wake up about an hour or two hours later. This side of my body would be sore from laying in that direction. My back would still be sore from laying on the recliner and I would have to change position again. All I would do is get up, switch the side of my bed and do that same motion back down. So now I'm on my left side. Six days of surgery, I was able to do this. and. Uh, that's how I used my bed and the recliner to shift positions and sleep in a few different ways and get through the night. Yeah, it's, it's definitely tricky to get comfortable in the first two weeks. Uh, but again, if you're expecting to be comfortable two weeks after a massive back surgery, I would say your expectations are a little bit misconstrued. I want to talk about my movement regimen. When I got out of the hospital, again, I was expecting to be doing three to five minutes at a time. However, as soon as I got out of the hospital, I was able to walk for 20 minutes straight. Uh, I've been slowly increasing. There hasn't been a day where my step count since being home has been under 4,000 steps. And yesterday was day 14. This was unintended, but here's my uh, step count yesterday. 14,000 steps on day 14. I am not feeling fatigued from it. I am not feeling increased soreness. I am feeling very good when I walk. I'm feeling like I want to continuously do more. I'm really shocked about that. I'm, my mobility is absolutely amazing right now. I'm also doing a bunch of other exercises. I am going to make a video strictly dedicated to post-surgery exercises. At this point, my on day, it's day 15 now. At this point, my medicine regimen is only to use painkillers to sleep and that other than that i'm just using tylenol uh i am a medical marijuana patient uh, so i do have a medical card i am using some medical marijuana i feel like that there's studies between uh using that and increased bone healing my doctor i did tell this very openly to my doctor he agreed he said definitely if you can do that go for it they also offered me medical marijuana in the hospital which i thought was uh i just didn't expect that like i was i told them i feel nauseous and then one of the nurses was like would you like maradol and i was like well what's what's that and they're like well we see you're uh, you have a medical marijuana license so 
would you like that? I was like, no, I don't need that right now on top of all the medicines that I was taking. It's not something I wanted, but it was an option and surprising at that. The items that I got for surgery, I, I haven't used as many pillows as I thought I'd use. I'm, I'm using more towels. They've been great to have. I've used all of them in some form or capacity, but like, I'm not like stacking my whole body with a ton of pillows like I thought I would. I'm the, the neck pillow has definitely been the most important thing for me, no matter where I am. This helps me get comfortable if I'm just, see how well I could put that on too. If I could just be here, this helps me like, you know, lean back and get comfortable. Um, or watching TV, you're sitting on, a, I have not sat on the couch yet, but even sitting on a chair in, in the other room, I could use this kind of to get a little comfortable. Um, I've had a home nurse come every two or three days that's covered by insurance. They changed the bandaging for me. Um, the scar is almost 14 inches big. They take one of these huge things, the nurse takes my vitals and switches this thing on my back. Here's a few, few pictures from the hospital uh, and a few videos. This is a photo of me with my surgeon in the x-ray room. He came to meet me uh, in the x-ray room when I was being discharged to look at the x-ray with me, show me. He also printed a copy of it for me, so I will also include that photo, as well as a photo of me and my amazing nurses at the hospital. Um, I did, uh, the hospital for, the whole staff at the hospital for special surgeries was over the top amazing. I've used numerous doctors in different fields there, like the, uh, an endocrinologist and a pain management specialist. Uh, my girlfriend has a home nurse that happens to work at a hospital for special surgery too. All of those people came to visit me in the hospital, which was very great. So Dr. Bachman, Dr. Cyril, Amanda, any of the people who came to visit me, if you ever see this, thank you so much. It was great to see a familiar face when my mom was my only allowed visitor during COVID. It was great to see you guys. Um, and I definitely appreciate you taking the time. Aside from that, I mean, my hospital stay was, was, was fantastic. My first two weeks have been fantastic. The reason why I think that's all happening is because the way I prepared my body and my mind. I think uh, the amount of exercises that I did pre-surgery helped prepare the rest of my body to handle this post-surgery. A lot of people think when a doctor tells you get strong before surgery and you're having back surgery, they just focus on back, 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 back. Well, when they cut open your spine and move all the muscles off your spine and then close you up and then tell you to wait six to eight weeks before you start training that again, you're really going to lose any progress you gained in those 30 days or pre-surgical training or anything that you did. So what you want to do is train the rest of your body. I was training, if you saw that video, I was training my abdominals. I was training a lot of my hips. I was training my cervical. I was training other areas to be stable around this operation. Uh, that's been very successful for me. Uh, my pain level has been great and managed. Uh, my mobility has been phenomenal because of the exercises that I'm doing. Because of the diet that I'm eating, I'm eating an incredibly anti-inflammatory diet. Again, he cut my whole spine open and, and, and cauterized the veins shut and whatever. There's so much inflammation in my body. The best thing that I can do is start ridding it of it, start hydrating as much as possible, having lean proteins and an anti-inflammatory diet. Hugely important and it seemed to be hugely successful. Third reason why I'm doing so well is because my expectations were managed. I didn't expect to be doing this well or doing well, at, honestly, I didn't expect to be doing well in any form of poor capacity within two weeks. Uh, and for that reason, anything that I feel like anything if I was doing horribly, I would have said this is to be expected and I wouldn't have been like that nervous or that overwhelmed by it. And if I had been doing any form of well or whatever, you would have gotten pretty much the same message from me of I'm doing amazing. How well I'm doing is actually way beyond anything I could have possibly drawn up. I did not expect to be able to walk 14,000 steps for months. I, uh, I'm able to put a shirt on after 12 days. I was able to get that. You see that going? I can do it. I can do it. Uh, I'm able to start to reach my arm up. If I'm on a wall, I can get this thing all the way up. Uh, if, you, if you have unrelenting spine pain and you're scared of going through the surgery because you're scared of the pain or because of the potential repercussions or because of it not going well or whatever, the way I looked at it, it's, it was kind of like taking a splinter out. It's like you can leave that splinter in and have pain with that splinter for the rest of your life and like maybe that splinter starts to spread an infection and starts to affect other areas of the body. Or you can just pull it out, get through those those few weeks or a few months in relative time to the rest of your, your life is not that much. Put in some really hard work and hopefully get to a better place. So 
I am now 15 days post-op. I'm not passing any judgment yet. Like I know the fusion doesn't set for a few months. Uh, I know a lot can still go wrong. I know the hardware could break, anything can malfunction. I'm not out of the woods. I'm just insanely cautiously optimistic. I couldn't be more hopeful. I'm feeling happy again, which is awesome. So the way I want to wrap up uh, this video before my next one, where I will talk to you guys and show you guys a lot about the post-surgical PT regimen and exercises that I'm doing, is by telling you guys a funny story about the the my second roommate, the one who ended up spending nights two and three with me after that older gentleman had left. Uh, this again, he's probably in his like 30s or 40s, middle-aged man. Uh, he was like French or Italian. I couldn't pick up what language it was. It definitely was not Spanish. It was terrible. He, he was one of the worst roommates you could possibly imagine because he was clearly FaceTiming another time zone. Uh, so every night until at least 4 a.m. he's FaceTiming and talking so loudly in a foreign language to someone that I just don't know, can't see, can't understand, but all I have to do is just keep hearing this guy chatter. Um, and you know what I was thinking the whole time was, somebody come fucking kill me. And I was thinking about the guy from night number one. My next video again, like I said, is gonna be about the PT exercises that I'm doing post-surgery and what that regimen looks like. And I'm also gonna do a video about the mental toll of Sherman's disease and how it affected me mentally, uh, how I know it affects a lot of other people with their, with their mentals, with their mindset, uh, and what steps one can take to work on that regardless of where they are in their process. Whether you're just finding out that you have Sherman's disease or you've had it for 20 years and you've dealt with it and you feel like your mind has gone to crap because of it. So, unfortunately, that's an all a uh, true statement for so many people who deal with Shermans. Uh, I certainly suffered mentally for a long time dealing with this disease. I'm just starting to come out of that now. Hopefully, um, you know, that's part of being very hopeful is I'm starting to feel happy again, as I mentioned. Uh, so video five will be about post-surgical exercises and video six will be about the mental side of Shermans disease. See you guys soon.